Good morning. We're, we're so glad that you could join us today. Today we continue our unquenchable series, and we'll hear from Andy a little later on as we journey through the book of Acts. This week we reach a, a milestone. We're actually a halfway through the book of Acts, chapter 14, 28 chapters in the book of Acts. So that's an exciting point to, to be at, and we're looking forward to, to going forward and, and learning much more. Um, whilst we provide this online gathering for the RCF family as a point of contact, uh, and, and we do miss each other, and we would rather be together, um, we, we are aware that there are some who drop in from time to time, and we've heard from some of you, and we've been so encouraged by your, your words of, and greetings. So if you're there and you've, you've been watching our meetings and you would like to get in contact with us, you could get in contact through uh, the contact box on our website under About Us at www.rcfnorthwales.com. Before we join in our morning gathering this morning, I, I would love to take this opportunity to pray. So, Father, I just pray, Lord, that you would help us this morning, that you would speak to us, that you would encourage us, that you would meet us where we are. Lord, your word says that if we draw near to you, you will draw near to us. And I pray at this time of gathering, as we draw near to you, we, we set our hearts to seek you Lord, we will find you because that's what your word says. Also, Lord, your word comforts us with these words that where two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst. So, Lord, we, we, we know, we believe, Lord God, that you are here with us this morning. Father, by your spirit, in the power of your name. Amen. Enjoy the morning meeting. Bless you. Bye-bye. The Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen.
Hi friends, what do you think of when you hear someone say the words, stand up? I'll give you a moment or two just to think about it. If you're at home with some family, you might like to discuss it. What do you think of? What comes to mind? Here are a number of things that came to mind for me. Uh, being told what to do in a church service. Time to stand up. Let's stand up and sing. Uh, going back to my school days, a um, number of reasons why a teacher would tell us to stand up. Because um, they wanted us to answer the question. They thought we weren't paying attention. Heaven forbid that I should not have paid attention in the school. <laughs> um, or they wanted us to, uh, to stand up so that we could be told off for something or they wanted us to show some good work that we'd done and we needed to stand up so everybody could focus on us while we did that. Uh, you might have thought about giving somebody a standing ovation, a great big clap and hooray for somebody that's done something really good. You might have thought of stand up to cancer or stand up comedy, maybe standing up against bullies, perhaps the phrase stand up and be counted or stand up and make a difference. I'm sure you have lots of other things too. You're welcome to put them in, if you're watching live um, on Sunday morning, you're welcome to put them in the WhatsApp group. Well, we're back in our series in Acts and we're picking up from where Owen left us last week um, in Acts 14. And he was speaking about Paul and Barnabas in Iconium. And there they had faced fierce opposition. So uh, they didn't run away, they stayed for a considerable amount of time. And while they were there, they preached boldly and we're told that God confirmed their message, proved their message with signs and wonders. Eventually, the opposition had had enough and a mob was gathered to stone them, but they found out about it ahead of time and they fled from there to the region of Lycaonia. We're gonna hear the next part of the story now. Thanks, Max. Acts 14 verses 8 to 20, the New Living Translation. While they were at Lystra, Paul and Barnabas came upon a man with crippled feet. He had been that way from birth, so he had never walked. He was sitting and listening as Paul preached. Looking straight at him, Paul realised he had faith to be healed. So Paul called to him in a loud voice, Stand up! and the man jumped to his feet and started walking. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in their local dialect, These men are gods in human form! They decided that Barnabas was the Greek god Zeus and that Paul was Hermes since he was the chief speaker. Now the temple of Zeus was located just outside the town, so the priests of the temple and the crowd brought bulls and wreaths of flowers to the town gates and they prepared to offer sacrifices to the apostles. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard what was happening, they tore their clothing in dismay and ran out among the people shouting, Friends, why are you doing this? We are merely human beings just like you. We have come to bring you the good news 
that you should turn from these worthless things and turn to the living God who made heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. In the past he permitted all the nations to go their own ways, but he never left them without evidence of himself and his goodness. For instance, he sends you rain and good crops and gives you food and joyful hearts. But even with these words, Paul and Barnabas could scarcely restrain the people from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews arrived from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowds to their side. They stoned Paul and dragged him out of town, thinking he was dead. But as the believers gathered around him, he got up and went back into the town. The next day he left with Barnabas for Derby. Thanks, Max. I want to suggest that this is a story of three stand-ups. Paul and Barnabas are in the Lycaonian town of Lystra. And we know that Lystra was mostly populated by Gentiles. Um, one of the things that we know from history is that there was no synagogue in the town. And so it might, on the face of it, look like an odd place for, um, for a Jew to go and preach. But that's where they found themselves, having um, escaped from Iconium. And um, while at Lystra, they come across a man who had never walked. He had been lame ever since he was born. He'd only ever just sat there, probably begged. And as Paul preached, this lame man, who's never walked his entire life, is just sitting there. In verse 9, Paul tells us two, th oh, we're told two things about this man. He was listening as Paul preached about Jesus. Paul had his attention. There was something about this message that was attractive to him. He was listening. And secondly, as Paul looked at him, maybe caught his eye, he realised something about this man. He had faith to be healed, we're told. How did Paul know that? They hadn't had a conversation, so far as we know. Maybe Paul saw there was something in his eyes. Maybe it was a Holy Spirit revelation. We're not told. What's the significance of this, faith, this phrase? He had faith to be healed. In what way is healing linked, linked to faith? Well, there are, of course, other examples in the New Testament, particularly in Jesus's um, earthly life. Um, do you remember in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 22, uh, the woman who touched Jesus, and we, and we read, Jesus turned round, and when he saw her, he said, daughter, be encouraged. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was healed at that very moment. And then in Mark chapter 10 and verse 52, we read of uh, the healing of Bartimaeus. Jesus said to him, go, for your faith has healed you. Instantly the man could see and he followed Jesus down the road. I love that word, instantly in there. And then there's something a little bit different in Mark chapter 9. The man whose son has, comes to Jesus because his son has an evil spirit. And Jesus said, anything is possible if a person believes. And the father instantly cried out, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. Hmm, interesting. That's a bit different. So there's clearly something that connects faith and healing in the New Testament. However, I would suggest it's less than clear that one the healing is completely dependent on the other, the, the faith. The man says, help my unbelief. Um, I don't believe for this, but help my unbelief. And Jesus heals his son anyway. So back to Acts 14. What happens next? Well, let's talk about what doesn't happen. <laughs> Do Paul and Barnabas lay hands upon the, the lame man and pray, ask God in the name of Jesus that he would heal him. No, nope. nothing like that happens. Sometimes healing in the New Testament happens that way. In fact, um, we're told in one of the letters that we, if we're, any of us is ill, we should call the elders of the church to anoint us with oil and lay hands on us and pray for healing. Sometimes, though, healing is just declared. I remember um, speaking a, 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 a good while ago now, a few months ago, on the story of... The, of um, Peter and John going to the temple and they met the lame man at the gate of the temple. Uh, um, 
And Jesus just told him in Jesus, uh, sorry, and Paul, Peter just told him in Jesus's name to get up and walk, and he did. In fact, he, he leapt about and danced. But on this occasion, we don't hear that he even mentions the name of Jesus directly in relation to this healing. Paul simply, it's much less churchy than that. Paul simply shouts out loudly to the man, stand up. Question, who had faith for the healing of this man at that point? Well, the lame man we're told did. Paul saw it, something in him that he saw that he had faith to be healed. But Paul, the one who was shouting at him, stand up, also had faith. And the man jumped to his feet, we read in verse 10. I bet he did. And he started walking. I bet it was a bit more than walking. As you suddenly discover for the first time in your life that you can walk. I bet he, I bet he did more than just walk. I bet he jumped and danced and, uh, and tried out what else, see what else he could do. Maybe the odd cartwheel after a bit. A couple of questions just to consider at this point. Do you need to be like Paul and call on someone who you know who is sick to stand up? It's a challenge, isn't it? Is that just for someone else? Or is it for all believers? Or maybe you're the sick person. Maybe there's things that you carried for a long time. Who needs to respond? There needs to be something in your eyes that says, actually, I've got faith to be healed. And you need to hear that cry, stand up. And stand up. And receive that healing, which is yours. Now remember, this is a pagan town. There's no synagogue. So the people of that town really have little or no spiritual reference point with which to process what's just happened or to draw them to the conclusion that um, it was the Jewish God that healed this man who's lived amongst them lame all his life. What they do have instead of that is a belief system built around the Greek pagan gods, which are, who aren't gods at all. So seeing this miracle, with their reference points, they decide that Paul and Barnabas must actually be gods. And they make as if to offer sacrifices to them. They bring bulls and they bring flower wreaths to the town gates, we read. Notice something. These pagan people had a capacity in them to worship, albeit the wrong things, but they had a capacity to worship. All people are created with a capacity to worship. And the role of the missionary church is to introduce them to the one that they were created to worship in spirit and in truth. Quickly realising what is about to happen, Paul and Barnabas intervene to stop them. <laughs> uh, he, he, we see in verse 15, he says, we're merely humans like you. Here's the second stand up of the story. The first one was the man who was lame, standing up and being healed. The second one, Paul himself, stands up against the people's erroneous beliefs. And Paul goes on, we read, to preach the good news. And um, it's what he does, isn't it? <laughs> we read Paul, he travels all over the place telling people about Jesus. And he told young Timothy, tell him about Jesus, Tim, whether it seems like the right time or not. Just tell him about Jesus. In the second part of verse 15, he tells them to turn to God. In verse 16, he warns them that although God's put up with their ways up to now, he's not going to put up with it anymore. Why? Because now there's been revelation and the gospel has been preached in their community. And in verse 17, he reminds them of the evidence in creation and in God's provision of the reality of God. So whether you've heard the good news or not, You've seen the signs in the way God provides for you and, and, in, and in, uh, in creation itself. Remember those verses in, in uh, Psalm 19, how clearly the sky reveals God's glory, how plainly it shows what he has done. Each night reveals it to the, to, to the following night um, and so forth. Now I note that there are now for these people, they're listening to Paul, three witnesses. There is the witness of the man's healing, 
There is the witness of Paul's preaching and there is the witness of God's provision for them. And yet they still haven't got it. <laughs> we read in verse 18. But even with these words, Paul and Barnabas could scarcely restrain the people from sacrificing to them. Enter stage left, the Jews from Iconium. Here comes trouble. They stir up the crowd who are easily swayed. <laughs> For the most part, they haven't believed in Jesus yet and they haven't received salvation. They're just enjoying the spectacle of this guy getting healed and these people sh shouting a bit. And so swayed by the Jews from Iconium, who you kind of get the impression they've probably come across them before, they stone Paul and drag him out of the town thinking he's dead. Here comes the third stand-up. It tells us in verse 20, as the believers gathered around him, he got up and he went back into town. Wow. <laughs> Note two things. It says, as the believers, in other translations, it says, as the disciples gathered around Paul. Clearly, here in Lystra, there are by now some disciples. There are some who have believed. There are some who are following the way. And they gather around Paul. And as they do that, Paul stood up. He's not dead. Although he's probably fairly badly, having just been stoned so that they thought he was dead and dragged him outside. He's probably fairly badly shaken and injured. Well, time to run away again, like in Iconium? No. Nope. What happened next? We read, he got up and went back into town. He went back for more. <laughs> Such is his heart for the gospel and for the lost people. So what about us? Do we carry that same heart? Are you ready to get stoned? <laughs> I don't mean that the way that some of you will be thinking now. To face opposition and even persecution. Are you ready to pick yourself up, stand up and go back for more? Maybe to share Jesus again with somebody who rejected it last time. What motivated Paul? He knew with absolute certainty what he was called to. Do we have that same calling? Do we have the same expectations? Do we have the same gospel? Certainly, yes. Do we have the same God? Absolutely. Do we have the same intention? Hmm. Let me ground this a little bit for you with a question that Rachel and I have been considering, which I invite you to consider and to act over in the next few weeks. Here's the question. What can we do to reach out to our community with the good news of Jesus this Christmas? Big ideas, small ideas, what can we do? What practical things? This time of year presents us with a prime opportunity in this nation. At Christmas time, people almost expect to hear about Jesus. It's part of the season. So why wouldn't we tell them? We're still considering and, and plan to talk to the other believers in Llanderville in our community too, but our, our thoughts and ideas at this stage include a number of things. A, a colouring competition for the village, a simple thing. Picture, pe inviting people to colour pictures that are related to the Christmas story with Bible verses on them. Do separate competitions for adults and children. Doing San Sanas, messy church, on Zoom. We can't do it in the village hall, it's not open. And we couldn't gather anyway. Uh, and we certainly couldn't serve full breakfast. But, but we could do something on Zoom that will reach out to families that we have contact with in our community. We're looking at a, a scripture union resource which gives um, a series of posters you can put around your community with Q, QR codes on. So a bit of a trail. And as, as families and individuals find those QR codes, they can... They can um, link with them on their, via the phone and, and it takes them to a, to a site that gives them a, a video telling part of the Christmas story uh, in English or in Welsh, depending on which code they pick out. There's an initiative too to sing Silent Night on Christmas Eve on their doorsteps at seven o'clock on, on Christmas Eve. 
lots of things we could do. There are lots more. That's our community. What would you do? What could you do? What will you do as you stand up for Jesus where he's put you?
Welcome back. We hope that what you've heard and seen has been of comfort and encouragement to you. Uh, the Bible says that we're to look for ways. Seriously, just look for ways that we might spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Not, not just random acts done in our own strength, but in and through the name of Jesus. And we want to encourage you this morning, not just to be hearers of the word, but also doers. And Jesus said, as freely as you've received, freely give. And one of the ways that helps us is through our missional rhythms of blessing, eating, listening, learning and sending. Last week, we challenged you to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to lay one of those rhythms on your heart. We weren't specific about it. We just said, just just choose one. Ask the Holy Spirit. Let him guide you. Choose one of those rhythms and, and then act upon it and then tell your story to someone else, because that's a part of the whole process is telling you stories of how God was active in your life. I don't know if you managed to do it, but if you did, let us know and we'd love to hear. This week, we're going to challenge you to eat a meal with someone, share a coffee. Just take time out of your life. Some of you are very busy, I know, with someone other than a close friend or a relative or maybe a member of RCF. Maybe that, that person, the Holy Spirit, has been quietly nudging you about for some time. Be brave. Take a step and see how God meets that need. You know, habits take time to develop. And this is about developing a habit that has potential kingdom impact. And that's what we want to say. That's what we want to be. We want to be kingdom people. Next Sunday is a Vision Sunday. It's the fifth Sunday in the month. And we take the opportunity to talk and share about issues at the heart of life in RCF, exploring the questions about what kind of people is God calling us to be? You know, we would really love you to be with us next week. So please make plans to do, to do that, to be with us at 10.15 next Sunday morning. As we close, we're going to pray together. The prayer that Jesus taught his disciples when they came to Jesus and they said, Jesus, we really don't know how to pray. Teach us how to pray. And then Jesus taught them this very simple prayer. It's our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And now we're going to pray our RCF family prayer. It's something we pray whenever we gather. Father, make us a church without walls, where Jesus Christ is the core of everything we do. Teach us how to love people better. Help us make disciples. Holy Spirit, equip us for reviving faith in our own communities. Keep us growing and maturing in you. Amen. And now the grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Bless you all. It's been great having you with us today. Uh, we just uh, we just love having you with us and we just love being able to gather like this. So we will see you next week. Bye bye.